Chapter 2, Society and the State. Anarchists make a clear distinction between society and the state. While they value society as a sum of voluntary associations, they reject the state as a particular body intended to maintain a compulsory scheme of legal order. Most anarchists have depicted the state as an extraneous burden placed on society which can be thrown off. Although more recently, some, like Gustav Lunderer, have stressed that the state is a certain relationship between human beings and overlaps society. Society for anarchists is, as Thomas Paine wrote, invariably a blessing in the repository of all what is good in humanity, cooperation, mutual aid, sympathy, solidarity, initiative, and spontaneity. It is therefore quite misleading, as Daniel Guerin has done, to suggest that the anarchist rejects society as a whole. Only the extreme individual is sterner attacks society as well as the state, and even he calls for an association or union of egoists, so society only as an aggregate of individuals, but he speaks on behalf of most anarchists when he asserts that the most desirable condition of the human species is the state of society. Anarchists argue that the state is a, in a, is a recent development in human social and political organization, and that for most of history, human beings have organized themselves in society without government and law in a peaceful and productive way. Indeed, in many societies, social order exists in inverse proportion to the development of the state. Pure anarchy in the sense of society with no concentration of force and no social controls has probably never existed. Stateless societies and peasant societies employ sanctions of approval and disapproval. The offer of reciprocity and the threat of its withdrawal as instruments of social control. But modern anthropology confirms that in organic or primitive societies, there is a limited concentration of force. If authority exists, it is delegated and rarely imposed, and in many societies no relation of command and obedience is in force. Ever since man avert emerged as homo sapiens, he has been living in, a, in stateless communities, which fall roughly into three groups. Acephalous societies, in which there is scarcely any political specialization and no formal leadership, though some individuals have prestige, chiefdoms in which the chief has no control of the concentrated force and whose hereditary prestige is largely dependent on generosity, and big man systems in which the charismatic big man collects his dues for the benefit of society. Anthropologists have described many different types of indigenous anarchies. They vary from gardeners to pastoralists, small groups like pygmies and Inuits in marginal areas to vast tribes like the Tiv in Nigeria or the Santals in East India. But while human beings have been living in such communities for 40 or 50,000 years, they have nearly all been absorbed or destroyed by states in the last couple of centuries. Most of these organic societies are quite libertarian, but some are characterized by ageism and sexism. They often have strong collective moral and religious systems which make people conform. Powerful moral and social pressures as well as supernatural sanctions are brought to bear by on any antisocial behavior. Yet for all their limitations, they show that the Hobbes, Hobbesian nightmare of universal war in a state of nature is a myth. A society without hierarchy in the form of rulers and leaders is not a utopian dream, but an integral part of the human collective experience. Anarchists wish to combine the ancient patterns of cooperation and mutual aid of these organic societies with a modern sense of individuality and personal autonomy. Apart from extreme individualists, anarchists thus see society as the nat natural condition of human beings which brings out the best in them. They consider society to be a self-regulating order which develops best when least interfered with. When asked what would replace the government, numerous anarchists have an answered, What do you replace cancer with? Proudhon was more specific and replied nothing. Society is eternal motion. It does not have to be wound up, and it is not necessary to beat time for it. It carries its own pendulum, 
and its ever wound wound up spring within it. An organized society needs laws as little as legislators. Laws are to society what cobwebs are to a beehive. They only serve to catch the bees. Anarchists thus believe that existing religious and political institutions are for the most part irrational and unnatural and prevent an orderly social life. Left to its own devices, society will find its own beneficial and creative co course. Social order can prevail in the fundamental sense of providing security of persons and property. This fundamental distinction between society and the state is held by liberal as well as anarchist thinkers. Locke depicted men in a state of nature as free and equal and regulated by the law of nature from which natural rights are derived. His notion of natural order existing independently of the state provides the theoretical grounds for the classic liberal defense of laissez-faire. He only differed from the anarchist in thinking that life in a state of nature could be uncertain and inconvenient without known laws and a limited government to protect the natural rights to life, liberty, and property. Anarchists agree with Locke that humanity has always lived in society, but argue that the government simply exasperates potential social conflict rather than offering a cure for it. Anarchists therefore believe that people can all live together in peace and freedom and trust. The social anarchists look towards natural solidarity to encourage voluntary cooperation, while the individualists consider it possible to regulate affairs through voluntary contracts based on rational self-interest. Even those few anarchists like Sebastian Fuhr, who see a struggle for survival in a state of nature, believe that without laws, master, and repression, the horrible struggle for life can be replaced by fertile agreement. There is therefore no sim simply no need for the night watchman state of the liberal, let alone for the ro roaring leviathan of authoritarian communists and fascists. Natural order can, be sp can spontaneously prevail. Natural order. A fundamental assumption of anarchism is that nature flourishes best if left to itself. A Taoist allegory goes, Horses live on dry land, eat grass, and drink. When pleased, they rub their necks together. When angry, they turn around and kick up their heels at each other. Thus far, only, only do their natural dispositions carry them. But bridled and bitted with a, a plate of metal on their foreheads, they learn to cast vicious looks, to turn the head to bite, to resist, to get the bit out of their mouth, or to bridle onto it, and thus their nature becomes depraved. The same might be said of human beings. It is interfering, dominating rulers who upset the natural harmony and balance of things. It is only when they try to work against the grain, to block the natural flow of energy, that trouble emerges in society. The anarchist's confidence in the advantages of freedom, of letting alone, is thus grounded in a kind of cosmic optimism without the interference of human beings. Natural laws will ensure that spontaneous order will emerge. In their concept of nature, anarchists tend to see the natural ground of society, not in a historical sense of things as they, they now are or have become, but in a philosophical sense of things as they may become. Like Heraclitus, they do not regard nature as a fixed state, but more as a dynamic process. You never put your foot in the same river twice. Where conservative thinkers believe that nature is best expressed in, thi in things as they are, that is, what history has produced so far, progressive thinkers look to nature to fulfill its potential. Most anarchists believe that the best w way to bring about improvement is to let nature pursue its own beneficent course. This confidence is in the beneficence of nature first emerges amongst the Taoists in ancient China, the early Greeks especially to the Stoics. Also felt by it that if human beings lived in conformity with nature, all would be well. By the time of the Middle Ages, nature came to be perceived in terms of a great chain of being, composed of an infinite number of continuous links ranging in hierarchical order from lowest form of being to the highest form. The absolute being of God. Woodcock has suggested that in their view of man's place in the world, anarchists believed in a modified version of the 
great chain of being. In fact, the conception of the universe as a chain of being, and the principles which underline this conception, plentitude, continuity, and graduation, were deeply conservative. Moreover, the hierarchical cosmogony of the chain of being, with its graduations from beast to angels, with man in the middle, reflected the social hierarchy of the period. In the 18th century, it led to the belief that there could be no improvement in the organization of society, and to the Pope's conclusion that whatever is, is right. Indeed, it was only towards the end of the 18th century, with the static notion of a chain of being being temporalized and replaced by a more evolutionary view of nature, that progressive thinkers began to appeal to nature as a touchstone to illustrate the shortcomings of modern civilization. The primitivist Rousseau reacted against the artificiality of European civilization by, ex by suggesting that we should develop a more natural way of living. The natural goodness of man has been depraved by government and political institution. It, it was therefore necessary to create them anew and in order to let nature, natural man flourish. There is undoubtedly a strong strand of primitism in anarchist thought. It takes both a chronological form in the belief that the best period of history was before the foundation of the state, and a cultural form in the idea that the acquisitions of modern civilization are evil. These beliefs can combine in the celebration of the simplicity and gentleness of what is imagined to be primitive life. Most anarchists, however, do not look back at some alleged lost golden age, but look forward to a new era of self-conscious freedom, they are, therefore, both primitivist and progressive, drawing inspiration from a happier way of life in the past and anticipating a new and better one in the future. This comes clearly through the work, through the work of Godwin, the first to give a clear statement of anarchist principles at the end of the 18th century. He saw nature in terms of natura naturans, things as they may become. He never lost his confidence in the possibility of moral and social progress. Even when, it, when an atheist, he believed that truth is omnipotent and universal in his old age, he began to talk of some mysterious and beneficent power which sustains and gives harmony to the whole universe. Proudhon also believed in universal natural law and felt that there is an imminent sense of justice deep within man. He carries within himself the principles of a moral cycle that goes beyond the individual. They constitute his essence and the essence of society itself. They are the characteristic molds of the human soul, daily refined and perfectly through social relations. Bakunin looked at nature and society in a more dialectical way and saw a change occurring through the reconciliation of, pro uh, of opposites. The harmony of natural forces appears only as a result of continual struggle which is the real condition of life and of movement in nature, as in society as well. Order without struggle is death. Nature itself only acts as an, in an unconscious way according to natural laws. Nevertheless, universal order exists in nature and society. Even man with his powers of reasoning is the material product of the union and action of the natural forces. Kropotkin not only felt like pr Proudhon, that the moral sense is innate, but that nature evolves principally through mutual aid to higher and more complex forms. Maletza questioned Kropotkin's excessive optimism and suggested that anarchy is the struggle in human society against the disharmonies of nature. But even th though he felt that natural man is a continuous state of conflict with his fellows, he believed social solidarity and harmony where, poss where possible. Modern theorists like Murray Bookchin and John Clark follow Kropotkin's lead in trying to link anarchism with ecology and to show that ecological principles of unity and diversity of harmony through complexity apply to a free society. All anarchists thus believe that without the artificial restrictions of the state and government, without the coercion of imposed authority, a harmony of interests among, hum among human beings will emerge. Even the most ardent of individualists are confident that if people follow their own interests in a clear-sighted way, they would be able to form unions to minimize conflict. Anarchists, whatever their persuasion, believe in spontaneous order. Given common needs, 
They are confident that human beings can organize themselves and create a social order which will impr prove far more effective and beneficial than any imposed authority. Liberty, as Pradown observed, is the mother, not the daughter of order. But while all anarchists call for the dissolution of the state and believe that social order will eventually prevail, they base their confidence on different premises and models. Individuals like Stirner and Tucker developed Adam Smith's economic vision in which a hidden hand will translate private interests into general good and promote the coincidence of interests. Since economic activity involves countless decisions and operations, it cannot be successfully regulated or directed by one individual or a group of individuals. It should therefore be left to itself, and a system of self-regulating economic harmony would result. In St. Simon's celebrated phrase, the administration of things would eventually replace the government of men. Godwin based his model of harmonious free society on the reign of reason in accordance with universal moral laws. Through education and enlightenment, people would become more rational and recognize universal truth and their common interests and act accordingly. All would listen to the voice of truth. Proudhon felt that people were necessarily dependent on each other and would gain from coordinating voluntarily their economic interests. Bakunin believed that conscience and reason were sufficient to govern humanity. Although he was enough of a Hegelian to depict human consciousness in a society developing through history in a dialectical way. Only popular spontaneous organizations could meet the growing diversity of needs and interests. Both Kropotkin and Tolstoy based their vision of social harmony on their observations of tribal organizations and peasant villages. They were impressed by the way in which such communities arrange their lives without law and government according to custom and voluntary agreement. At the same time, Kropotkin tried to ground anarchism in the scientific study of society and natural history, and to demonstrate that it was a rational philosophy which sought to live in accordance with natural and social laws. Human beings, he argued, had evolved from natural instincts of sympathy and cooperation, which were repressed or distorted in authoritarian and capitalist states. In the spontaneous order of a free society, they would re-emerge and be strengthened. State and Government The state did not appear until about 5,500 years ago in Egypt. While great empires like those in Chinese and Romans ebbed and flowed, with no clear boundaries on their outer limits, most of the world's population continued to live in clans or tribes. Their conduct was regulated by customs and taboos. They had no laws, political administrations, courts, or police to maintain order and cohesion. The state emerged with economic inequality, but it was only when a society was able to produce a surplus which could be appropriated by a few that private property and class relations were developed. When the rich called on the support of the shaman and the warrior, uh, the state and, as an association claiming supreme authority in a given area began to emerge. Laws were made to protect private property and for, enforced by a special group of armed men. The state was thus founded on social conflict, not as Locke imagined by rational men of goodwill, who made a social contract in order, a, in order to set up a government to make life more certain and convenient. Kropotkin, in his study of the origin of the state, argues that Roman, the Roman Empire was a state, but that the Greek cities and the medieval city republics were not. In European nation, he argues, that the state barely dates from the 16th century when it took over the free towns and their federations. It resulted from a triple alliance of lords, lawyers and priests who dominated society. They were later joined by the capitalists who, who continued to strengthen and centralize the state and crush free initiative. The people, in the meantime, were persuaded to cooperate with the process and grew accustomed to voluntary servitude. Most anarchists would accept this vision of history in general terms. While society was in, invariably a blessing, they accept that the state is an artificial superstructure separate from society. It is an instrument of oppression and one of the principal causes of social evil 
They therefore reject the idealist view put forward by Rousseau that the state can express the general will of the people. They will not have none of the Hegelian mysticism, which tries to see the state as the expression of the spirit of a nation. They do not believe that it forms a moral being or a body politic, which is somehow greater than the sum of its parts. They look through its mystifying ceremony and ritual which veil its naked power. They question its appeals to patriotism and democracy to justify the rule of the ruling minority. They do not even accept the liberal contention that the state can be considered a center of sympathy and cooperation in certain areas. On the other hand, anarchists have no trouble in accepting that Max Weber's definition of the state as a body, which claims the monopoly of legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. It uses its monopoly of force through the army and police to defend against foreign invasion and internal dissension. As a supreme authority w within a given territory, it claims to be the sole legitimate right to command its citizens and to be obeyed. Anarchists also agree with the socialists that the state invariably controlled by the rich and powerful and that its legislation in is invariably made in the interests of the dominant elite. Godwin saw, like Mark, that the rich are always directly or indirectly legislators of the state and that government per perpetuated the economic inequality in society. Kropotkin argued that the state has always been, both in ancient and in modern history, the instrument for establishing monopolies in favor of ruling minorities. With the abolition of the state, anarchists assume that greater equality will eventually be achieved, but they propose widely different economic systems ranging from laissez-faire, based on private property, to voluntary communism. There is a of course, a difference between the state and government. Within a given territory, the state remains while governments come and go. The government is the body within the state that claims legitimate authority to make laws. It also directs and controls the state apparatus. It follows certain procedures for obtaining and using power. Based on a constitution or custom, Tucker defined the state as a monopoly of governments in a particular area and governments as an invasion of the individual's private sphere. Most anarchists, however, use the term state and government loosely as if they were synonymous for the repository of political authority in a society. While all anarchists are opposed to the state, a few are ready to allow government in an attenuated form in a transitional period. Godwin, at a time when nation-states in Europe were beginning to take on their, their modern form, wrote mainly about the evils of government. He argued that men associated at first for the sake of mutual assistance, but the errors and the pervasiveness of the few led to the need of restraint in the form of government. But while the government was intended to suppress injustice, its effect had, had been to per perpetuate it by concerning the force of the community and aggravating the inequality of property. Once established, governments impede the dynamic creativity and spontaneity of the people. They lay their hand on the spring there is in a society, and put a stop to its motion. Their tendency is to perpetuate abuse. Whatever was once thought right and useful, they undertake to entail to the latest posterity. They reverse the general propensities of man, and instead of suffering, they proceed to teach us to look backward for, per for perfection. They prompt us to seek the public welfare, not in alteration and improvement, but in a timid reverence of the, for the decisions of our ancestors, as if the nature of human mind were always to de degenerate and never to advance. The individualist Sterner, on the other hand, focused on the state as the cause of evil. Every state is a despotism, be the despot or one or many. Its one purpose is to limit, control, and subordinate the individual. Not all anarchists are consi as consistent as Godwin and Stirner. Proudhon asserted that the government of man by man is servitude. 
but he paradoxically defined anarchy as the absence of a ruler or a sovereign as a form of government. In his late work on federalism, he even saw a positive role for the state as the prime mover and overall director in society. Nevertheless, he acknowledged that anarchical government is a contradiction in terms, and left one of the most damning description of government and bureaucracy ever made. To be governed is to be watched over, inspected, spied on, directed, legislated, regimented, closed in, indoctrinated, preached at, controlled, assessed, evaluated, censored, commanded, all by creatures that have neither the right, nor wisdom, nor virtue. To be governed means that at every move, operation, or transaction, one is noted, registered, entered in a census, taxed, stamped, priced, assessed, patented, licensed, authorized, recommended, admonished, prevented, reformed, set right, corrected. Government means to be subjected to tribute, trained, ransomed, exploited, monopolized, extorted, pressured, mystified, robbed, all in the name of public utility. And the general good, then at the first sign of resistance or a word of complaint, one is repressed, fined, despised, vexed, pursued, hustled, beaten up, garroted, imprisoned, shot, machine gun, judged, sentenced, deported, sacrificed, sold, betrayed, and to cap it all, ridiculed, mocked, outraged, and dishonored. That is government. That is justice and its morality. Bakunin reserved some of his finest rhetoric for his condemnation of the state for crushing the spontaneous life of society, but he too was not always consistent. The first international Bakunin and his supporters allowed the terms of regenerate state, new and revolutionary state, or even socialist state to stand as synonyms for social collective, but aware of the ambiguity which could be exploited by the authoritarian socialists and Marxists, they went on to propose federation, or solidarison, or of communes, as a more accurate description of what they wanted to see to replace the existing state. In his speech at the Basel Congress of 1869, Bakunin thus made clear that he was voting for the collectivization of social wealth, by which he meant the expropriation of all who are now proprietors by the abolition of the juridical and political state, which is the sanction and sole guarantor of property as it now is. As a subsequent form of organization, he favored that the solidarization of communes, because the solidarization entails the organization of society from the bottom up. The practice among some anarchists to confuse the government and the state appears most clearly in Malatestia in his pamphlet Anarchy, 1891. He defined the state as the sum of total political, legislative, judiciary, military, and financial institutions, though which the management of their affairs, the control over the personal behavior, the responsibility for their personal safety, are taken away from the people and entrusted to others who by usurpation and delegation are vested with the powers to make the laws for everything and everybody, and to oblige the people to observe them, if need be, by use of collective force. But he added that in this sense the word state means government, or to put it another way, the impersonal abstract expression of the state of affairs personified by government. Since the word state is often used to describe a particular human collectivity, gathered in particular territory, and to mean the supreme administration of a country, we refer, referred to replace the expression abolition of the state with the clear, more concrete term abolition of government. Kropotkin was concerned about abolishing both the government and the state. He defined as anarchism as no government system of socialism, and a principle or theory of life and conduct under which society is conceived without government. In his work on the origins of the state, 1897, Kropotkin distinguished between the state and government. He does not consider all governments to, to be equally bad, for he praises the medieval cities and their governmental institutions, with their assemblies, elected judges, and military force subordinates to the civil authority. But when the state emerged, it not only included the existence of a power situated above society, like the government, but also a 
territorial concentration and a concentration of many or even all functions of society in the hands of a few. It implies some new relationships between the members of a society which did not exist before the formation of the state. It had been the historical mission of the state to prevent the direct association among men, to shackle the development of local and individual initiative, to crush existing liberties, to prevent their new blossoming. All this in order to subject the masses to the will of minorities. This century, the anarchist critique of the state has become more sophisticated. Gustav Laudrer has suggested that the state is a condition, a certain relationship between human beings, a mode of behavior. We destroy it by contracting other relationships by behaving differently. Only when people make the existing connection between them in a bond in an organic community can the legal order of the state be made obsolete. More recently, Murray Bookchin has argued per persuasively that the state is not merely a a constellation of bureaucratic and coercive institution, but also a state of mind, an instilled mentality for ordering reality. In liberal democracies this century, its capacities for brute force has been limited, but it continues to have a powerful psychological influence by creating a sense of awe and powerlessness in its subjects indeed. It has become increasingly difficult to fix its boundaries in the line between the state has that the state and society has it's become so blurred that now the state is a hybridization of political with social institutions of coercive with distributive function of highly punitive with so with regulatory procedures and finally of class with administrative needs liberal democracy it is on the issue of the state that anarchists part company with their liberal and socialist allies. Liberals maintain that a state as a compulsory legal order is necessary to protect civil liberties and rights, to deal with disputes and conflicts in society with an unfettered economy. As the liberal thinker L.T. Hobhouse wrote, the function of state coercion is to override individual conversion, and of course, coercion exercised by any association of individuals within the state, it is by this means that it maintains liberty of expre expression, security of person and property, genuine freedom of con contract, the rights of public meeting and association, and finally its own power, to carry out common pro objects undefeated by the rec recalcitrance of individual members. Anarchists argue that, on the other hand, that even the most minimal night watchmen, state advocated by modern libertarians, would be controlled by the rich and powerful, and be used to defend their interests and privileges. However much it claims to protect individual rights, the government will always become an instrument in the hands of the ruling classes to maintain power over the people. Rather than providing healthy stability, it prevents positive change instead of imposing order. It creates conflict where it tries to foster enterprise. It destroys initiative. It claims to bring about security, but only increases anxiety. Although anarchists feel that representative democracy is preferable to monarchy, aristocracy, or despotism, they still consider it to be essentially oppressive. They rebuke the twin pillars of the democratic theory of the state. Representation and majority rule in the first place. No one can truly represent anyone else, and it is impossible to delegate one of one's authority. Secondly, the majority has no more right to dictate to the minority, even a minority of one, than the minority of the major or to the majority. To decide upon truth by the casting up of votes, Godwin's wrote is a flagrant insult to all reason and justice. The idea that the governments can control the individual and his property simply because it reflects the will of the majority is therefore plainly unjust. Anarchists also reject the liberal theory of the social contract beloved by Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau. No government, in their view, can have power over any individual who refuses it refuses his consent, and it is absurd to expect someone to give his consent individually to all laws. The American individualist Linzander Spooner exploded the contractual theory of the state by ana analyzing the U.S. Constitution. 
He could find no evidence of anyone ever making a contract to set up a government, and agreed that it was absurd to look to the practice of voting or paying taxes as evidence of tacit consent. It is plain, he concluded, that on the general principles of law and reason, the Constitution is no contract, that it binds nobody and never did anybody, and that all those who pretend to act by its authority are mere usurpers, and that everybody not only has the right, but is morally bound to treat them as such. Not all anarchists share the same view of contracts among individuals. Godwin rejected all forms of contracts since they, are usually, they usually result in past folly governing future wisdom. If an action is right, it should be performed. If not, avoided. There is no need for the additional obligation of a contract. On the other hand, both Proudhon and Kropotkin look to contracts in the form of voluntary agreements to regulate affairs between people in an anarchist society without the state. But since such contracts are not legally enforceable and carry no sanctions, they are more like declarations of intent than binding contracts in the conventional sense. The only reason why people would keep them is the pragmatic one if one individual habitually broke his contracts, he would soon find few people to enter into an agreement with him. Anarchists have few illusions about the nature of liberal democracy and representative government. When Proudhon entered briefly the National Assembly during the 1848 Revolution, it confirmed what he had long suspected. As soon as I set foot in the parliamentary Sinai, I ceased to be in touch with the masses. Fear of the people is the sickness of all those who belong to authority. The people, for those who are in power, are the enemy. Henceforth, he declared, universal suffrage is the counter-revolution, and insisted that the struggle should take place in the economic and not the political arena. Bakunin never entered a parliament as a representative or joined a political party. From the beginning, he, he was well aware that whoever talks of political power talks of domination, and insisted that all political organization is destined to end in the negation of freedom. Although during the Spanish Civil War, anarchists did participate in a short, for a short while in the Republican government in order to fight Franco's rebels. The historic anarchist movement has consistently preached the abstention from conventional politics, hence the popular slogan, whoever you f vote for, the government always gets in. Or better still, if voting changed anything, they'd make it illegal. As a result for the social struggles of the last two centuries, the modern liberal state has, of course, been obliged to provide for welfare and education for its citizens. Some anarchists, like Nicholas Walter, have suggested that not all state institutions are wholly bad, since they can have a useful function when they challenge the use of authority by other institutions, and when they promote certain desirable social activities. Thus we have a liberatory state and the welfare states the state working for freedom and the state working for equality. Nevertheless, the principal role of the state has always been to limit freedom and maintain inequality. Although it may have been a benevolent face, the welfare state can be restrictive by intensifying its grips on the lives on the, of the subjects through registration, regulation, and supervision. It creates a surely and overblown bureaucracy. It can, as George Woodcock has argued, become just as ingenious a means of repression and regimentation as any more overtly totalitarian system. It single ha singularly fails to make people happy, and by offering a spurious security, it undermines the practice of mutual aid. It tends to be wasteful by not dis directing resources to no those most in need, Instead of paying taxes to the state, which then decides who is in need, anarchists prefer to help directly the disadvantaged by vol voluntary acts of giving or by participating in community organizations. The same arguments against the liberal state apply to the socialist state. Only more so, anarchists reject the claim that made by democratic socialists that the state is the best means of redistributing wealth and providing welfare in practice. The social state tends to spawn a vast bureaucracy which stifles the life of the community.
It creates a new elite of bureauc bureaucrats who often administer in their own interests rather than in the interests of those they are meant to serve. It encourages dependency and conformity by threatening to withdraw its aid or by rewarding, rewarding those it favors. By undermining voluntary associations and the practice of mutual aid, it eventually turns society into a lonely crowd buttressed by the social worker and policemen. Only if social democrats adopt a libertarian and decentralized form of socialism can anarchists join them in their endeavors and encourage them to adopt the principles of voluntary federation and association. The Marxist State at first sight, anarchists and Marxists would seem to have much in common. Both criticize existing states as protecting the interest of the privileged and wealthy. Both share a common vision of a free and equal society as the ultimate ideal. But it is with Marxist-Leninists that anarchists have encountered the greatest disagreement over the role of state, the state in society. The issue led to the great dispute between Marx and Bakunin in the 19th century, which eventually led to the demise of the first International Working Men's Association. In The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State, Engels argued like Kropotkin that the state had emerged recently in human history as an apparatus of rule separate from society. The state, then, has not existed from all eternity. There have been societies that did without it, that had no idea of the state and state power. It had developed only with the division of society into classes and become a coercive machine for maintaining the rule of one class over another. The capitalist state provided liberty only for those who owned property and subjugation for the rest, workers and peasants. Engels, however, was confident that his generation was approaching a stage in the f development of the production when classes of the state would inevitably fall. When that time comes, society which will reorganize production on the basis of free and equal association of the producers will put the whole machinery of the state where it will then belong, into a museum of antiquities, by the side of the spinning wheel and the bronze axe. Although Marx and Engels felt it was necessary for the proletariat to take over this, the states, to hold down their adversaries, and to reorganize production, they both looked forward to a time when the proletariat would abolish its supremacy, as a class and society would become an association in which the free development of each is a condition for the free development of all. It was Engels' contention that in his anti during that the interference of the state becomes superfluous in one sphere after another, so that the government of persons is replaced by the administration of th things. In the process, the state is not abolished, it withers away. Engels, however, insisted on the need for a state to be tra in a transitional period of socialism before communist society could be established. While Bakunin and the anarchists claimed that the direct democracy of the Paris Commune provided a model of a free society, Engels argued that the anarchists put the thing upside down. They declared that the proletarian revolution must begin with doing away from the political organization of the state, but to destroy it at such a, mo at such a moment would be to destroy the only organism by me by means of which the victorious proletariat can assert its newly conquered power, hold down its capitalist adversaries, and carry out the economic revolution of society. Lenin developed Marx and Engels' view of the state as a general principle. He declared that we Marxists are opposed to all and every kind of state. In his pamphlet, The State and Revolution, written in August 1917, on the eve of the Bolshevik seizure of power, Lenin gave the most idyllic semi-anarchist account of the proletarian revolution, describing how the state could begin to wither away immediately after its victory. Indeed, Lenin considered the issue of the state to be of the utmost importance in the coming revolution. He, 
in his commentary, Plekhanov's pamphlet, Anarchism and Socialism, 1894, he criticizes Plekhanov for contriving completely to ignore the most urgent, burning, and politically most essential issue in the struggle against anarchism, viz. the relation of the revolution to the state. And the question of the state in general, he further differed from Engels, who believed that the factory is, an, is necessarily authoritarian in its organization by maintaining that it would be possible under communism to operate modern industrialized society without the need for compulsion and narrow specialization. But Marxists and anarchists disagree profoundly over the means of realizing this desirable state of affairs. Marx suggested that the need for the dictatorship of the proletariat in a transitional socialist period and it has since become a central part of Marxist-Leninist orthodoxy. Yet the difference between anarchists and Marxists is more than simply a question of tactics. It also involves substantial theoretical differences. Marx's dispute with Bakunin did have an important historical dimension, but it was fired by theoretical considerations as well. He attacked Stirner in the German ideology and predowned in the poverty of philosophy for their failure to appreciate dialectical materialism, where Marx tried to reverse Hegel's position and give primacy to the capitalist economy over the bourgeoisie state. Many anarchists per persisted in seeing the state as a, de as a determining influence over the economy, rather than recognizing the need to wait for economic conditions to develop before abolishing the state. Some placed their confidence in the creative power of revolutionary will. Marx, also opposed to the anarchist rejection of, of opposed authority, he was keen to alter the form of authority in a communist society, but did not seek to abolish the principle of authority altogether. He thought it was not only necessary to seize state power in order to defend the revolution, but also to develop new kinds of social control of the productive forces. The anarchists failed, in Marx's eyes, to develop the, a coherent class analysis either by taking an individual's position like Stirner, by adopting a pretty bourgeoisie approach, like Proudhon in his defense of the peasantry, or by having an opportunist or voluntarist faith like Bakunin. In the creative energies of the undefined people and the lump, lumpen proletariat, there is, of course, some substance to this criticism. Unlike Marxists, anarchists do not have a specific class base. They recognize the differences in power and wealth between the rich and poor and align themselves with the people and stress the role of different classes at different times. Proudhon stating his career mainly concerned with the peasantry only to finish up considering favorably the political capacity of the working class. Bakunin sometimes used the rhetoric of the working class and the proletariat, but when he specified who the revolutionary workers were, they turned out to be the less education, educated urban proletarians and the peasants. Although he felt, like Marx, that the proletarians would lead the revolution, he went out of his way to stress the revolutionary potential of the peasantry. In addition, he looked to the dispossessed and disinherited to rise up since they had nothing to lose but their chains. Above all, Marx criticized the anarchists for struggling on the economic and cultural level only and failing to grasp the need for the working class to conquer political power. Politics, even in its parliamentary form, could be progressive for Marx. He even entertained the view that it was possible to use political means in order to go beyond the conventional politics. In his instructions to the Geneva Congress of the International, he argued against the Proudhonists that the working class could win reforms through general laws enforced by power of the state, and in enforcing such laws, the working class do not fortify government power. On the contrary, they transform that power now used against them in their own agency. Referring to Bakunin, he declared Contemptuously, this ass cannot even understand that any class movement as such is necessarily, and always has been, a political movement. 
In particular, he condemned Bakunin for believing that the will, and not the economic conditions, is the foundation of the social revolution. In his dealings with Stirner, Proudhon, and Bakunin, Marx certainly emerges at his least appealing and his most hectoring and heavy-handed. He has not only revealed the authoritarian tendency of his own social and political thought, but also the authoritarian nature of his own personality. Moreover, his anti-anarchist maneuvers, which led to the demise of the First International, ensured that future internationals in the controls of Marxists would become rigid and monolithic, and that Marxism itself would harden into a dogmatic creed which bro brooked no dissent. Lenin, more than anyone else, helped to contribute to this process. He took issue with the anarchists primarily on the role of the states in the revolution. He argued that they were wrong in not wanting to abolish the state, but in wanting to abolish it overnight. Lenin felt it was essential to smash the inherited bureaucratic military state machine, but this did not mean doing away with the state power altogether, since it was necessary for the proletariat to use it during its dictatorship in a transi transitional period. Like Marx, Lenin believed that in the democratic centralism, centralism, it was therefore necess necessary to strengthen and centralize the pow state power in order to oppose counter-revolutionary forces and to crush the resistance of the bourgeoisie. Lenin has been accused of hypocrisy in his call for the withering away of the state immediately before its seizure of power in Russia. Certainly after the Bolshevik seizure of power in October 1917, he proceeded to undermine the power of the Soviets and establish a hierarchical and centralized structure of command by the vanguard, Communist Party in his work, Left-Wing Communism, and Infantile Disorder. He proceeded to castigate anarchists and socialist revolutionaries for their immature opportunism in wanting to abolish the state immediately on the morrow of revolution. He narr narrated how Bolshevikism became steeled in its struggle against petty bourgeoisie revolutionism which smacks of or, bo or borrows some something of anarchism and which easily goes to revolutionary ext extremes, but is incapable of perseverance, organization, and discipline, and steadfastness. Indeed, he declared that anarchism was not infrequently a sort of punishment for the opportunist sins of the working class movement. He found to his dismay that certain sections of the industrial workers of the world and anarcho-syndicalist trends in Russia continued to uphold the errors of left-wing communism all their admiration of the Soviet system. Yet despite his centralizing and strengthening of the state and his liquidation of the anarchist opposition, Lenin still firmly believed that the withering away of the state was the final goal of communism. In a lecture on the state, he insisted that while it was necessary to place the machine, or bludgeon, of the state in the hands of the class that is to overthrow the power of capital, he looked to a time where they shall consign this machine to the scrap heap. Then there will be no state and no exploitation. Whatever Lenin's ultimate ideal, his reliance on a vanguard communist party to steer the dictatorship of the proletariat led eventually to the dictatorship of the party, but also the, the dictatorship of one man, Stalin, in the Soviet Union. Moreover, than any other major Marxist-Leninist revolutions of this century, in China, North Korea, Vietnam, Cuba, democratic centralism has resulted in practice in highly hierarchical authoritarian states controlled by an elitist party. The dire warnings of Bakunin that a worker state would lead to a new red bourgeoisie have been tragically confirmed. The communist states have emerged this century amply to demonstrate the anarchist fear that a people state or revolutionary government would not only perpetu perpetuate but extend tyranny. Law. The anarchists like liberals see the state as primarily a legal association and law is made is its mode of action. It is designed to maintain a compulsory degree of legal order. Its principal bodies, the legislator, judiciary, and executive, are responsible for making, interpreting, and enforcing the law. 
Strictly speaking, a law is a rule of conduct made by government and enforced by a state. Tolstoy described laws vividly as rules made by people who govern by means of organized violence for non-compliance, with which the non-compliant is subjected to blows to loss of liberty or even being murdered. Laws restrict our liberty by making us act or refrain from acting regardless of our wishes. They stand like high hedges, keeping us on the straight and narrow. The methods used by the state to enforce its laws are those of compulsion. The ultimate power of the law is the coercive power of the state. As Hobbes recognized, the authority of Leviathans is ultimate, ultimately based on the sword, or its modern equivalent, the policeman's cosh or the sol soldier's gun. Indeed, as Tolstoy observed, the characteristic feature of the government is that it claims a moral right to inflict physical penalties and by its decree make murder a good action. Since they reject the state, it is therefore inevitable that anarchists reject its most coercive expression in the law. In the words of G Jean Grave, anarchy demonstrates that there cannot be any good laws nor good government, nor faithful applications of the law. All human law is arbitrary. Of all anarchists, Godwin was the earliest and most trenchant critic of law. In the first place, he argued that man-made law is unnecessary since immutable reason is the true legislator. Men can do no more than declare and interpret the rules of universal justice as perceived by reason. Secondly, the principal weakness of law is its, is its status as a general rule. No two actions are the same, and yet the law absurdly tries to re reduce the myriad of human actions to one common measure, and as such operates like Proctrusus's bed in the Greek legend which cuts or stretches whoever lays on it. Thirdly, law is inevitably made in the interest of the lawmakers, and as such is a venal compact by which superior tyrants have purchased the content continuancy and alliance of the inferior. Above all, like governments, it fixes the human mind in a stagnant condition and prevents that unceasing progress which it is in a natural tendency. Godwin was certain that the punishment, the voluntary infliction of evil on a vicious being, threatened or imposed by law, is not an appropriate way to reform human conduct. Since men are products of their environment, they cannot, strictly speaking, be held responsible for what they do. An assassin is no more guilty of the crime he, he commits than the dagger he holds. Since they are in the grip of circumstances, they do not have free will. There can therefore be no moral justification in punishment, whether it be for retribution, example, or reform. All punishment is a tactic confession of imbecility. Indeed, it is worse than the original crime since it uses force where rational persuasion is enough. Coercion cannot convince or create respect. It can only sour the mind and alienate the person against whom it is used. Godwin was convinced that law, like government, is not only harmful but unnecessary. His remedy for antisocial acts was to reduce the occasion for crime by eradicating its causes in government and accumulated property, and by encouraging people through education to think in terms of the general good rather than private interest. Since vice is principally, principally error, enlightenment will be enough to make people virtuous. Godwin is realistic enough to recognize that even in a free society, it may not be necessary to restrain violent people on a temporary basis, but they should always be treated kindly and kept within the community as far as possible. Instead of resorting to courts and professional lawyers, disputes could be solved by popular juries who consider the specific circumstances of each case. There is no maxim more clear than this. Every case is a rule to itself. The aim should always be to resolve conflict rather than apportion blame. Eventually, Godwin believed it would on only be necessary to recommend rather than enforce the decisions of juries. In place of law, the power of public opinion would suffice to check antisocial acts, and once the rules of justice were properly understood by the community, then laws would become unnecessary. After Godwin, 
Kropotkin offered the most cogent anarchist criticism of the law. All legislation within the state, he asserted, has always been made with regard to the interest of the privileged classes. He traced the origins of law to the first to the most primitive superstitions, and then to the decrees of conquerors. Originally, human relations were regulated by customs and usages, but the dominant minority used law to make immutable those customs which were to their advantage. Law thus made its appearance under the sanction of the priest, and the warrior's club was placed at its service. Kropotkin divided the millions of laws which exist to regulate humanity into three main categories, the protection of property, the protection of governments, the protection of persons. The first is intended to appropriate the product of the worker's labor, or to deal with quarrels between monopolists. As such, they have no other object than to protect the unjust appropriation of human labor. The second category, constitutional law, which is intended to maintain the administrative machine, which almost entirely serves to protect the interests of the possessing classes. The third category, the protection of the persons, is the most important, since such laws are considered indispensable to the maintenance of security in European society. These laws developed from the nucleus of customs which were useful to human communities, but since they have been adopted by rulers to sanctify their domination, they have become as useless and injurious as other categories of law. Kropotkin argued that the main supports for crime and idleness, law and authority, but since about two-thirds of existing crimes are crimes against property, they will disappear, or be limited to, qu to a quite trifling amount. When property, which is now a privilege of a few, shall return to its real source, the community, for those people who will still be antisocial and violent, Kropotkin insists that punishment is not appropriate since the severity of punishment does not diminish the amount of crime. Talking from his own experience of Russian and French prisons, he condemned prisons for killing physical energy, destroying the individual will, and encouraging society to treat the liberated prisoner as something plague-stricken. It is not possible to improve prisons. The prisons, the more prisons are reformed, the more detestable they become. Modern penitentiaries are far worse than the dungeons of the Middle Ages. The best cure for antisocial tendencies is to be found in human sympathy, Kropotkin concludes. People without political organizations, and therefore less depraved than ourselves, have perfectly understood that the man who is called criminal is simply, simply unfortunate. That the remedy is not to flog him, to chain him up, or to kill him, on the scaffold or in the prison, but to help him by the most brotherly care, by treatment based on equality, by the usages of life amongst honest men. Anarchists assume that there would be a greater harmony of interests amongst individuals living in a society without government, law, and unequal property, but they do not think that everyone would immediately behave in a responsible fashion and there would be no more disputes or conflict in place of the force of law. Godwin and Kropotkin recommend that the influence of public opinion and mutual censure to reform conduct there is, of course, a possibility that the tyranny of public opinion could replace the oppression of the law. But while Godwin and Kropotkin allow censure as a form of social control, they insist that people should decide for themselves how they should behave. Again, in a society where antisocial individuals are considered to be sick and in need of cure, psychological manipulation can be more coercive than, and tyrannical than imprisonment. Use of psychiatry to form dissidents has become notorious and authoritarian societies. Sterner put the problem succinctly: curative means or healing is only the reverse side of punishment. The theory of cure runs parallel to the theory of punishment. Of the, if the latter sees in an action a sin against right, the former takes it for a sin of the man against himself as a decadence from his health. With their concern for personal autonomy and individual freedom, anarchists, more than any other socialists, are aware of the inhumanity of both physical punishment and manipulative cure for antisocial members of the community. They look to reasoned argument and friendly treatment to deal with criminals and wish to respect the humanity and individuality. 
the nation state. The nation state has become the norm of modern political organization and the main ob object of its citizens' loyalties. The state is considered the guardian of the nation's identity and colonized people who win their independence invariably strive to set up their own nation state. Yet many nations exist without their own states, and many states consist of several different nations. The nations in the, in the state are not therefore synonymous, nor are they necessarily desirable. From the beginning, the anarchists have questioned the legitimacy of the nation states and strongly resisted their formation. They have not however, ignored the strong emotional pull of nationalism and patriot, patriotism, and some, notably Proudhon and Bakunin, have succumbed to it. Like the ancient Stoics, the anarchists have always been cosmopolitan and internationalist in outlook, and considered themselves citizens of the world. In general, they have supported national liberation struggles as part of a wider struggle for freedom, but they have opposed the status aspiration and executive exclusive loyalties of the nationalists. They are particularly critical of patriotism, which makes the ruled identify with the rulers and become their obedient cannon fodder. They also recognize the rivalry between nation states as one of the principal causes of war. Godwin was highly critical of Russio and others who exhorted people to love their country and to sink the personal existence of individuals in the existence of the community, as if it were an abstract thing. The love of our country is one of those specious illusions which are employed by impostors for the purpose of rendering the multitude the blind instruments of their crooked designs. It makes us consider whether... Whatever is gained for country as so much gained for our darling selves. Patriotism, moreover, leads to a spirit of hatred and all uncharted, uncharitableness towards the countries around us. In place of a narrow patriotism, Godwin taught universal benevolences. We should help the most needy and worthy, regardless of our personal connections. We should act as impartial spectators. And, and not be swayed by the ties of family, tribe, country, or race. And since ideas of great empire and of legislative unity are plainly the barbar barbarous remains of the days of military heroism, Godwin looked to a decentralized society of federated parishes to replace the nation-state. Tolstoy, like Godwin, also rigorously condemned patriotism. He saw it inextricably, inextricably linked with government. By, by supporting government and fostering war, he declared patriotism to be a rude, harmful, disgraceful, and bad feeling, and above all, immoral, since it influences man to see himself as the son of his fatherland and the slave of his government, and commit, action, commit actions contrary to his reasons and his conscience. He felt that if people could understand that they are not the sons of some fatherland or other, nor of governments, but the sons of God, they would be neither slaves nor enemies to each other. Not all anarchists, however, have condemned patriotism so roundly as Godwin and Tolstoy. Proudhon was undoubtedly, undoubtedly a French nationalist. As he grew older, he not only celebrated the French revolutionary tradition, but also the French people and their heritages. He was markedly anti-Semitic. Nevertheless, he argued that federalism is the only answer to end the rivalry between nations and to dissolve empires. Like Rousseau, he felt that the larger a nation in territory or population, the greater the danger of tyranny. He therefore urged a process of decolonization as the United States and Canada had from England, and looked to a time when Algeria could constitute itself as an African France. Bakunin was a nationalist before becoming an anarchist. He tended to harbor nationalist prejudices, celebrating the freedom-loving and spontaneous Slavs, and condemning the militaristic Germans. He thought Marx was a 
thoroughgoing authoritarian, partly because he was a German and a Jew. However, Bakunin's early support for Polish nationalism and Panslavism was motivated by a desire to break up with the Russian Empire and to set its colonized people free. He expressed strong sympathy for any national uprising against any form of oppression, and declared that every people has the right to be itself and no one is entitled to oppose, impose its costumes, its customs, its language, its opinions, or its laws. While Bakunin believed that nationalism was a natural nationalism was a natural fact, and that each nation had an incontestable right to free development, he did not think nationalism acceptable as a legitimate political principle, because it has an exclusive tendency and lacks the power of universality. In a subtle analysis of patriotism, he distinguished three types. The first is natural, an instinctive, mechanical, uncritical attachment to the so socially accepted heredity or traditional patterns of life. But while it is an expression of social solidarity, it exists to an inverse ratio to the evolution of humanity. The second is the bourgeoisie, the object of which is to maintain the power of the nation-state so that the mainstay of all pri privileges of the exploiters throughout the nation. The third is proletarian, the only truly acceptable form of patriotism, which ignores national differences and state boundaries and embraces the world. Bakunin therefore looked to a large fraternal union of mankind and extended the principle of federalism to work to the world as a whole. As a transition to a federation of all nations, he called for the United States uh, of Europe as the only way of making civil war between different peoples of European family impossible. The United States he had in mind, however, would not be a centralized bureaucratic and military federation, but organized from the bottom up, with member nations having the right to secession. True internationalism, he insisted, rests on self-determination. Each individual, each association, commune, or province, each region and nation has the absolute right to determine its own fate, to associate with others or not, to ally itself with whoever it will, or to break any alliance without regard to so-called historical claims or the convenience of its neighbor. Only in this way would nations cease to be the products of conquest and historical and geographical distortion in the long run. However, Bakunin believed that the national question is secondary to the social revolution and that the social revolution should become a world revolution. Rudolf Rocker has provided the most incisive condemna condemnation of the nation-state in his vast study, Nationalism and Culture, 1937. For Rocker, the nation is not the origin, but the product of the state. It is the state which creates the nation, and not the, n the nation the state. The nation cannot, theref cannot therefore exist without the state. But he does not deny local feelings of attachment to a culture and land. He distinguishes between a people which the natural result of a of social union, a mutual association brought about by a common language and particular conditions of living, and the nation which is the artificial struggle for political power. A people always consists of com community with narrow boundaries, while a nation often encapsulates a whole array of different peoples who have, by more or less violent means, been oppressed into the frame of a common state. He therefore condemned nation nationalism for trying to create artificial barriers and di disturbing the organic unity of the community. Gustav Laud Launderer who was strongly influenced by Proudhon, made an interesting attempt to combine nationalism and anarchism. He contrasted, like Rocker, the community against the state. The people in a state of society do not find themselves together in, in the organism of true community. Community, however, exists alongside and outside the state, but has not yet been fully realized. A free community is therefore not the founding of something new. 
but the actualization and reconstruction of something that has always been present, which exists alongside the state, albeit buried in laid waste. It is necessary to develop this community made from the union of persons and families into various communities and communities into associations. The nationhood of a people, according to Launderer, remains once, once statehood has been superseded. Nationhood consists of the closeness of people together in their way of life, language, tradition, and memories of a common fate, and works to create a real communal living. It follows that nothing but the rebirth of all people out of the spirit of regional community can bring salvation. But while Lauderer wanted to revive old communal traditions and dissolve the state, his vision was not parochial. It would seem that the essential features of Rucker's concept of a people are to be found in Launderer's concept of the nation. The nation for Launderer is not an artificial whole, but a community of communities. The artificial, moreover, should not identify only with his nation, but see it as one ring in the widening circle of humanity. Anarchists have thus mounted the most consistent and rigorous critique of the state, whether it is in liberal or social democratic or Marxist form. While the state may have been intended to suppress injustice and oppression, they argue that it has only aggravated them. It fosters war and national rivalries. It crushes creativity and independence. Governments and the laws through which they impose their will are equally unnecessary and harmful. At the same time, their confidence in natural order leads anarchists to believe that society will flourish without imposed authority and external coercion. People thrive best when least interfered with. Without the state, they will be able to develop initiative, form voluntary agreements, and practice mutual aid. They will be able to become fully realized individuals, combining ancient patterns of cooperation with a modern sense of individuality. The anarchist critique of the state not only questions many of the fundamental assumptions of political philosophy, but challenges the authoritarian premises of Western civilization.